Dedication, Address, and Prefaces to Master Humphrey's Clock This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Brad Philippone Dedication of Master Humphrey's Clock To Samuel Rogers, Esquire My dear sir, let me have my pleasures of memory in connection with this book by dedicating it to a poet whose writings, as all the world knows, are replete with generous and earnest feeling, and to a man whose daily life, as all the world does not know, is one of active sympathy with the poorest and humblest of his kind, your faithful friend, Charles Dickens. Address by Charles Dickens, April 4, 1840 Master Humphrey earnestly hopes, and is almost tempted to believe, that all degrees of readers, young or old, rich or poor, sad or merry, easy of amusement or difficult to entertain, may find something agreeable in the face of his old clock, that when they have made its acquaintance its voice may sound cheerfully in their ears, and be suggestive of none but pleasant thoughts that they may come to have favourite and familiar associations connected with its name and to look for it as a welcome friend from week to week then master humphrey will set his clock trusting that while it counts the hours it will sometimes cheat them of their heaviness and that while it marks the thread of time it will scatter a few slight flowers in the old mower's path until the specified period arrives and he can enter freely upon that confidence with his readers which he is impatient to maintain he may only bid them a short farewell and look forward to their next meeting preface to the first volume when the author commenced this work he proposed to himself three objects first to establish a periodical which should enable him to present under one general head, and not as separate and distinct publications, certain fictions that he had it in contemplation to write. Secondly, to produce these tales in weekly numbers, hoping that to shorten the intervals of communication between himself and his readers would be to knit more closely the pleasant relations that they had held for forty months. Thirdly, in the execution of this weekly task, to have as much regard as its exigencies would permit to each story as a whole, and to the possibility of its publication at some distant day apart from the machinery in which it had its origin. The characters of Master Humphrey and his three friends, and the little fancy of the clock, were the results of these considerations. When he sought to interest his readers in those who talked and read and listened, he revived Mr. Pickwick and his humble friends, not with any intention of reopening an exhausted and abandoned mine, but to connect them in the thoughts of those whose favourites they had been with the tranquil enjoyments of Master Humphrey. It was never the intention of the author to make the members of Master Humphrey's clock active agents in the stories they are supposed to relate. Having brought himself in the commencement of his undertaking to feel an interest in these quiet creatures, and to imagine them in their chamber of meeting, eager listeners to all he had to tell, the author hoped, as authors will, to succeed in awakening some of his own emotion in the bosoms of his readers. Imagining Master Humphrey in his chimney-corner, resuming night after night the narrative, say, of the old curiosity-shop, picturing to himself the various sensations of his hearers, thinking how Jack Redburn might incline to poor Kit, and perhaps lean too favourably even towards the lighter voices of Mr. Richard Swiveller, how the deaf gentleman would have his favourite and Mr. Miles his, and how all these gentle spirits would trace some faint reflection in their past lives in the varying currents of the tale he has insensibly fallen into the belief that they are present to his readers as they are to him and has forgotten that like one whose vision is disordered he may be conjuring up bright figures when there is nothing but empty space 
The short papers which are to be found at the beginning of the volume were indispensable to the form of publication and the limited extent of each number, as no story of length or interest could be begun until the clock was wound up and fairly going. The author would fain hope that there are not many who would disturb Master Humphrey and his friends in their seclusion, who would have them forego their present enjoyments, to exchange those confidences with each other, the absence of which is the foundation of their mutual trust. For when their occupation is gone, when their tales are ended, and but their personal histories remain, the chimney-corner will be growing cold, and the clock will be about to stop for ever. One other word in his own person, and he returns to the more grateful task of speaking for those imaginary people whose little world lies within these pages. It may be some consolation to those well-disposed ladies and gentlemen who, in the interval between the conclusion of his last work and the commencement of this, originated a report that he had gone raving mad, to know that it spread as rapidly as could be desired, and was made the subject of considerable dispute, not as regarded the fact, for that was as thoroughly established as the duel between Sir Peter Teasel and Charles Surface in the School for Scandal, but with reference to the unfortunate lunatic's place of confinement, one party insisting positively on Bedlam, another inclining favourably towards St. Luke's, and a third swearing strongly by the asylum at Hanwell, while each backed its case by circumstantial evidence of the same excellent nature as that brought to bear by Sir Benjamin Backbite on the pistol-shot which struck against the little bronze bust of Shakespeare over the fireplace, grazed out of the window at a right angle, and wounded the postman who was coming to the door with a double letter from Northamptonshire. It will be a great affliction to these ladies and gentlemen to learn, and he is so unwilling to give pain, that he would not whisper the circumstance on any account, did he not feel in a manner bound to do so, in gratitude to those amongst his friends who were at the trouble of being angry at the absurdity that their inventions made the author's home unusually merry, and gave rise to an extraordinary number of jests of which he will only add, in the words of the good vicar of Wakefield, I cannot say whether we had more wit among us than usual, but I am sure we had more laughing. Devonshire Terrace, York Gate, September 1840 Preface to the Second Volume An author, says Fielding, in his introduction to Tom Jones, ought to consider himself not as the gentleman who gives a private or eleemosynary treat, but rather as one who keeps a public ordinary, to which all persons are welcome for their money. Men who pay for what they eat will insist on gratifying their palates, however nice and whimsical these may prove, and if everything is not agreeable to their taste, will challenge a right to censure, to abuse, and to damn their dinner without control. To prevent, therefore, giving offence to their customers by any such disappointment, it hath been usual with the honest and well-meaning host to provide a bill of fare which all persons may peruse at their first entrance into the house, and having thence acquainted themselves with the entertainment which they may expect, may either stay and regale with what is provided for them, or may depart to some other ordinary better accommodated to their taste. In the present instance, the host or author, in opening his new establishment, provided no bill of fare. Sensible of the difficulties of such an undertaking in its infancy, he preferred that it should make its own way, silently and gradually, or make no way at all. It has made its way, and is doing such a thriving business that nothing remains for him but to add, in the words of the good old civic ceremony, now that one dish has been discussed and finished, and another smokes upon the board, that he drinks to his guests in a loving cup, and bids them a hearty welcome. Devonshire Terrace, London, March 1841 Master Humphrey's Clock, Section 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Master Humphrey's Clock by Charles Dickens. Chapter 1. Part 1. Master Humphrey from his clock side in the chimney corner. The reader must not expect to know where I live. 
At present, it is true, my abode may be a question of little or no import to anybody. But if I should carry my readers with me, as I hope to do, and there should spring up between them and me feelings of homely affection and regard attaching something of interest to matters ever so slightly connected with my fortunes or my speculations, even my place of residence might one day have a kind of charm for them. Bearing this possible contingency in mind, I wish them to understand, in the outset, that they must never expect to know it. I am not a churlish old man. Friendless I can never be, for all mankind are my kindred, and I am on ill terms with no one member of my great family. But for many years I have led a lonely, solitary life. What wound I sought to heal, what sorrow to forget, originally matters not now. It is sufficient that retirement has become a habit with me, and that I am unwilling to break the spell which for so long a time has shed its quiet influence upon my home and heart. I live in a venerable suburb of London, in an old house which in bygone days was a famous resort for merry roisterers and peerless ladies, long since departed. It is a silent, shady place, with a paved courtyard, so full of echoes, that sometimes I am tempted to believe that faint responses to the noises of old times linger there yet, and that these ghosts of sound haunt my footsteps as I pace it up and down. I am the most confirmed in this belief because of late years the echoes that attend my walks have been less loud and marked than they were wont to be, and it is pleasanter to imagine in them the rustling of a silk brocade and the light step of some lovely girl than to recognize in their altered note the failing tread of an old man. Those who like to read of brilliant rooms and gorgeous furniture would derive but little pleasure from a minute description of my simple dwelling. It is dear to me for the same reason that they would hold it in slight regard. Its worm-eaten doors and low ceilings crossed by clumsy beams, its walls of wainscot, dark stairs, and gaping closets, its small chambers communicating with each other by winding passages or narrow steps, its many nooks scarce larger than its corner cupboards, its very dust and dullness are all dear to me. The moth and spider are my constant tenants, for in my house the one basks in his long sleep, and the other plies his busy loom secure and undisturbed. I have a pleasure in thinking on a summer's day how many butterflies have sprung for the first time into light and sunshine from some dark corner of these old walls. When I first came to live here, which was many years ago, the neighbours were curious to know who I was, and whence I came, and why I lived so much alone. As time went on, and they still remained unsatisfied on these points, I became the centre of a popular ferment, extending for half a mile round, and in one direction for a full mile. Various rumours were circulated to my prejudice. I was a spy an infidel, a conjurer, a kidnapper of children, a refugee, a priest, a monster. Mothers caught up their infants and ran into their houses as I passed. Men eyed me spitefully and muttered threats and curses. I was the object of suspicion and distrust, I of downright hatred, too. But when in course of time they found I did no harm, but on the contrary inclined towards them despite their unjust usage, they began to relent. I found my footsteps no longer dogged as they had often been before, and observed that the women and children no longer retreated, but would stand and gaze at me as I passed their doors. I took this for a good omen, and waited patiently for better times. By degrees I began to make friends among these humble folks, and though they were yet shy of speaking, would give them good day, and so pass on. In little time those whom I had thus accosted would make a point of coming to their doors and windows at the usual hour, and nod or courtesy to me. Children, too, came timidly within my reach, and ran away quite scared when I patted their heads and bade them be good at school. These little people soon grew more familiar. From exchanging mere words, of course, with my older neighbours, I gradually became their friend and adviser the depository of their cares and sorrows, and sometimes, it may be, the reliever, in my small way, of their distresses. And now I never walk abroad, but pleasant recognitions and smiling faces wait on Master Humphrey. 
it was a whim of mine perhaps as a whet to the curiosity of my neighbours and a kind of retaliation upon them for their suspicions it was i say a whim of mine when i first took up my abode in this place to acknowledge no other name than humphrey with my detractors i was ugly humphrey when i began to convert them into friends i was mr humphrey and old mr humphrey at length i settled down into plain master humphrey which was understood to be the title most pleasant to my ear and so completely a matter of course has it become that sometimes when i am taking my morning walk in my little courtyard i overhear my barber who has a profound respect for me and would not i am sure abridge my honours for the world holding forth on the other side of the wall touching the state of master humphrey's health and communicating to some friend the substance of the conversation that he and master humphrey have had together in the course of the shaving which he has just concluded that i may not make acquaintance with my readers under false pretences or give them cause to complain hereafter that i have withheld any matter which it was essential for them to have learnt at first i wish them to know and i smile sorrowfully to think that the time has been when the confession would have given me pain that i am a misshapen deformed old man i have never been made a misanthrope by this cause i have never been stung by any insult nor wounded by any jest upon my crooked figure as a child i was melancholy and timid but that was because the gentle consideration paid to my misfortune sunk deep into my spirit and made me sad even in those early days i was but a very young creature when my poor mother died and yet i remember that often when i hung around her neck and oftener still when i played about the room before her she would catch me to her bosom and bursting into tears would soothe me with every term of fondness and affection god knows i was a happy child at those times happy to nestle in her breast happy to weep when she did happy in not knowing why these occasions are so strongly impressed upon my memory that they seem to have occupied whole years i had numbered very very few when they ceased for ever but before then their meaning had been revealed to me i do not know whether all children are imbued with a quick perception of childish grace and beauty and a strong love for it but i was i had no thought that i remember either that i possessed it myself or that i lacked it but i admired it with an intensity that i cannot describe a little knot of playmates they must have been beautiful for i see them now were clustered one day round my mother's knee in eager admiration of some picture representing a group of infant angels which she held in her hand whose the picture was whether it was familiar to me or otherwise or how all the children came to be there i forget i have some dim thought it was my birthday but the beginning of my recollection is that we were all together in a garden and it was summer weather i am sure of that for one of the little girls had roses in her sash there were many lovely angels in this picture and i remember the fancy coming upon me to point out which of them represented each child there and that when i had gone through my companions i stopped and hesitated wondering which was most like me I remember the children looking at each other, and my turning red and hot, and their crowding round to kiss me, saying that they loved me all the same, and then when the old sorrow came into my dear mother's mild and tender look, the truth broke upon me for the first time, and I knew, while watching my awkward and ungainly sports, how keenly she had felt for her poor crippled boy i used frequently to dream of it afterwards and now my heart aches for that child as if i had never been he when i think how often he awoke from some fairy change to his own old form and sobbed himself to sleep again well well all these sorrows are past my glancing at them may not be without its use for it may help in some measure to explain why i have all my life been attached to the inanimate objects that people my chamber and how i have come to look upon them rather in the light of old and constant friends than as mere chairs and tables which a little money could replace at will chief and first among all these is my clock my old cheerful companionable clock how can i ever convey to others an idea of the comfort and consolation that this old clock has been for years to me 
It is associated with my earliest recollections. It stood upon the staircase at home. I call it home still mechanically, nigh sixty years ago. I like it for that, but it is not on that account, nor because it is a quaint old thing in a huge oaken case curiously and richly carved, that I prize it as I do. I incline to it as if it were alive, and could understand and give me back the love I bear it. And what other thing that has not life could cheer me as it does? What other thing that has not life, I will not say how few things that have, could have proved the same patient, true, untiring friend? How often have I sat in the long winter evenings, feeling such society in its cricket voice, that raising my eyes from my book and looking gratefully towards it, the face reddened by the glow of the shining fire has seemed to relax from its staid expression and to regard me kindly. How often in the summer twilight, when my thoughts have wandered back to a melancholy past, have its regular whisperings recalled them to the calm and peaceful present! How often in the dead tranquillity of night has its bell broken the oppressive silence, and seemed to give me assurance that the old clock was still a faithful watcher at my chamber door! My easy chair, my desk, my ancient furniture, my very books, I can scarcely bring myself to love even these last like my old clock. It stands in a snug corner, midway between the fireside and a low arched door leading to my bedroom. Its fame is diffused so extensively throughout the neighbourhood that I have often the satisfaction of hearing the publican or the baker, and sometimes even the parish clerk, petitioning my housekeeper, of whom I shall have much to say by and by, to inform him the exact time by Master Humphrey's clock. My barber, to whom I have referred, would sooner believe it than the sun, nor are these its only distinctions. It has acquired, I am happy to say, another, inseparably connected it not only with my enjoyments and my reflections, but with those of other men, as I shall now relate. I lived alone here for a long time without any friend or acquaintance. In the course of my wanderings by night and day, at all hours and seasons, in city streets and quiet country parts, I came to be familiar with certain faces, and to take it to heart as quite a heavy disappointment if they failed to present themselves each at its accustomed spot. But these were the only friends I knew, and beyond them I had none. It happened, however, when I had gone on thus for a long time, that I formed an acquaintance with a deaf gentleman which ripened into intimacy and close companionship. To this hour I am ignorant of his name. It is his humour to conceal it, or he has a reason and purpose for so doing. In either case I feel that he has a right to require a return of the trust he has reposed, and as he has never sought to discover my secret, I have never sought to penetrate his. There may have been something in this tacit confidence in each other flattering and pleasant to us both, and it may have imparted in the beginning an additional zest, perhaps, to our friendship. Be this as it may, we have grown to be like brothers, and still I only know him as the deaf gentleman. I have said that retirement has become a habit with me. When I add that the deaf gentleman and I have two friends, I communicate nothing which is inconsistent with that declaration. I spend many hours of every day in solitude and study, have no friends or change of friends but these, only see them at stated periods, and am supposed to be of a retired spirit by the very nature and object of our association. We are men of secluded habits, with something of a cloud upon our early fortunes, whose enthusiasm nevertheless has not cooled with age, whose spirit of romance is not yet quenched, who are content to ramble through the world in a pleasant dream, rather than ever waken again to its harsh realities. We are alchemists who would extract the essence of perpetual youth from dust and ashes, tempt coy truth in many light and airy forms from the bottom of her well, and discover one crumb of comfort or one grain of good in the commonest and least regarded matter that passes through our crucible. Spirits of past times, creatures of imagination, and people of to-day are alike the objects of our seeking, and unlike the objects of search with most philosophers, we can ensure their coming at our command. 
the deaf gentleman and i first began to beguile our days with these fancies and our nights in communicating them to each other we are now four but in my room there are six old chairs and we have decided that the two empty seats shall always be placed at our table when we meet to remind us that we may yet increase our company by that number if we should find two men to our mind when one among us dies his chair will always be set in its usual place but never occupied again and i have caused my will to be so drawn out that when we are all dead the house shall be shut up and the vacant chairs still left in their accustomed places it is pleasant to think that even then our shades may perhaps assemble together as of yore we did and join in ghostly converse one night in every week as the clock strikes ten we meet at the second stroke of two i am alone and now i shall tell how that my old servant besides giving us note of time and ticking cheerful encouragement of our proceedings lends its name to our society which for its punctuality and my love is christened master humphrey's clock now shall i tell how that in the bottom of the old dark closet where the steady pendulum throbs and beats with healthy action though the pulse of him who made it stood still long ago and never moved again there are piles of dusty papers constantly placed there by our hands that we may link our enjoyments with my old friend and draw means to beguile time from the heart of time itself shall i or can i tell with what a secret pride i open this repository when we meet at night and still find new store of pleasure in my dear old clock friend and companion of my solitude mine is not a selfish love i would not keep your merits to myself but disperse something of a pleasant association with your image through the whole wide world i would have men couple with your name cheerful and healthy thoughts i would have them believe that you keep true and honest time and how it would gladden me to know that they recognize some hearty english work in master humphrey's clock the clock case it is my intention constantly to address my readers from the chimney corner and i would fain hope that such accounts as i shall give them of our histories and proceedings our quiet speculations or more busy adventures will never be unwelcome lest however i should grow prolix in the outset by lingering too long upon our little association confounding the enthusiasm with which i regard this chief happiness of my life with that minor degree of interest which those to whom i address myself may be supposed to feel for it i have deemed it expedient to break off as they have seen but still clinging to my old friend and naturally desirous that all its merits should be known i am tempted to open somewhat irregularly and against our laws i must omit the clock case the first roll of paper on which i lay my hand is in the writing of the deaf gentleman i shall have to speak of him in my next paper and how can i better approach that welcome task than by prefacing it with a production of his own pen consigned to the safe-keeping of my honest clock by his own hand the manuscript runs thus introduction to the giant chronicles once upon a time that is to say in this our time the exact month and day are of no matter there dwelt in the city of london a substantial citizen who united in his single person the dignities of wholesale fruiterer alderman common councilman and member of the worshipful company of pattern makers who had superadded to these extraordinary distinctions the important post and title of sheriff and who at length and to crown all stood next in rotation for the high and honourable office of lord mayor he was a very substantial citizen indeed his face was like the full moon in a fog with two little holes punched out for his eyes a very ripe peer stuck on for his nose and a wide gash to serve for a mouth the girth of his waistcoat was hung up and lettered in his tailor's shop as an extraordinary curiosity he breathed like a heavy snorer and his voice in speaking came thickly forth as if it were oppressed and stifled by feather beds 
he trod the ground like an elephant, and eat and drink like, like nothing but an alderman, as he was. This worthy citizen had risen to his great eminence from small beginnings. He had been once a very lean, weazen little boy, never dreaming of carrying such a weight of flesh upon his bones or of money in his pockets, and glad enough to take his dinner at a baker's door, and his tea at a pump. But he had long ago forgotten all this, as it was proper that a wholesale fruiterer, alderman, common councilman, member of the worshipful company of patent makers, past sheriff, and, above all, a lord mayor that was to be, should. And he never forgot it more completely in all his life than on the 8th of November in the year of his election to the great golden civic chair, which was the day before his grand dinner at Guildhall. It happened that as he sat that evening all alone in his counting-house, looking over the bill of fare for next day, and checking off the fat capons in fifties, and the turtle soup by the hundred quarts for his private amusement, it happened that as he sat alone occupied in these pleasant calculations, a strange man came in and asked him how he did, adding, "'If I am half as much changed as you, sir, you have no recollection of me, I am sure.' The strange man was not over and above well-dressed, and was very far from being fat or rich-looking in any sense of the word, yet he spoke with a kind of modest confidence, and assumed an easy, gentlemanly sort of an air to which nobody but a rich man can lawfully presume. Besides this, he interrupted the good citizen just as he had reckoned three hundred and seventy-two fat capons, and was carrying them over to the next column, as if that were not aggravation enough, the learned recorder for the City of London had only ten minutes previously gone out at that very same door, and had turned round and said, "'Good night, my lord.' Yes, he had said, "'My lord.' he a man of birth and education of the honourable society of the middle temple barrister at law he who had an uncle in the house of commons and an aunt almost but not quite in the house of lords for she had married a feeble peer and made him vote as she liked he this man this learned recorder had said my lord i'll not wait till to-morrow to give you your title my lord mayor says he with a bow and a smile you are Lord Mayor de facto, if not de jure. Good night, my lord. The Lord Mayor-elect thought of this, and, turning to the stranger and sternly bidding him go out of his private counting-house, brought forward the three hundred and seventy-two fat capons, and went on with his account. Do you remember, said the other, stepping forward, do you remember little Joe Toddyhigh? The port wine fled for a moment from the fruiterer's nose as he muttered, "'Joe Toddyhigh, what about Joe Toddyhigh?' "'I am Joe Toddyhigh,' cried the visitor. "'Look at me, look hard at me, harder, harder. You know me now? You know little Joe again? What a happiness to us both to meet the very night before your grandeur. Oh, give me your hand, Jack, both hands, both, for the sake of old times.' "'You pinch me, sir. You're a-hurting of me,' said the Lord Mayor-elect pettishly. "'Don't suppose anybody should come. Mr. Toddyhigh, sir. Mr. Toddyhigh,' repeated the other ruefully. "'Oh, don't bother,' said the Mayor-elect, scratching his head. "'Dear me, why, I thought you was dead. What a fellow you are!' Indeed, it was a pretty state of things, and worthy the tone of vexation and disappointment in which the Lord Mayor spoke joe toddyhigh had been a poor boy with him at hull and had oftentimes divided his last penny and parted his last crust to relieve his wants for though joe was a destitute child in those times he was as faithful and affectionate in his friendship as ever man of might could be they parted one day to seek their fortunes in different directions joe went to sea and the now wealthy citizen begged his way to london they separated with many tears like foolish fellows as they were and agreed to remain fast friends, and, if they lived, soon to communicate again. When he was an errand-boy, and even in the early days of his apprenticeship, the citizen had many a time trudged to the post-office to ask if there were any letter from poor little Joe, and had gone home again with tears in his eyes, and when he found no news of his only friend. The world is a wide place, and it was a long time before the letter came. When it did, the writer was forgotten. It turned from white to yellow, from lying in the post-office with nobody to claim it, and in course of time was torn up with five hundred others, and sold for waste-paper. 
and now at last, when it might least have been expected, here was this Joe Toddyhigh turning up and claiming acquaintance with a great public character, who on the morrow would be cracking jokes with the Prime Minister of England, and who had only at any time during the next twelve months to say the word, and he could shut up Temple Bar and make it no thoroughfare for the King himself. "'I am sure I don't know what to say, Mr. Toddyhigh,' said the Lord Mayor-elect. "'I really don't. It's very inconvenient.' i'd sooner have given twenty pound it's very inconvenient really a thought had come into his mind that perhaps his old friend might say something passionate which would give him an excuse for being angry himself no such thing joe looked at him steadily but very mildly and did not open his lips of course i shall pay you what i owe you said the lord mayor-elect fidgeting in his chair you lent me I think it was a shilling, or some small coin, when we parted company, and that, of course, I shall pay with good interest. I can pay my way with any man, and always have done. If you look into the mansion-house the day after to-morrow, some time after dusk, and ask for my private clerk, you'll find he has a draft for you. I haven't got time to say anything more just now, unless—' he hesitated, for, coupled with a strong desire to glitter for once in all his glory in the eyes of his former companion, was a distrust of his appearance, which might be more shabby than he could tell by that feeble light. "'Unless you'd like to come to the dinner to-morrow. I don't mind your having this ticket, if you'd like to take it. A great many people would give their ears for it, I can tell you.' His old friend took the card without speaking a word, and instantly departed. His sunburnt face and grey hair were present to the citizen's mind for a moment, but by the time he reached three hundred and eighty-one fat capons he had quite forgotten him. Joe Toddyhigh had never been in the capital of York before, and he wandered up and down the streets that night amazed at the number of churches and other public buildings, the splendour of the shops, the riches that were heaped up on every side, the glare of light in which they were displayed, and the concourse of people who hurried to and fro, indifferent apparently to all the wonders that surrounded them. But in all the long streets and broad squares there were none but strangers. It was quite a relief to turn down a byway and hear his own footsteps on the pavement. He went home to his inn, thought that London was a dreary, desolate place, and felt disposed to doubt the existence of one true-hearted man in the whole worshipful company of patent-makers. Finally he went to bed, and dreamed that he and the Lord Mayor-elect were boys again. He went next day to the dinner, and when, in a burst of light and music, and in the midst of splendid decorations and surrounded by brilliant company, his former friend appeared at the head of the hall, and was hailed with shouts and cheering. He cheered and shout with the best, and for the moment could have cried. The next moment he cursed his weakness in behalf of a man so changed and selfish, and quite hated a jolly-looking old gentleman opposite for declaring himself in the pride of his heart a patent maker As the banquet proceeded, he took more and more to heart the rich citizen's unkindness, and that not from any envy, but because he felt that a man of his state and fortune could all the better afford to recognize an old friend, even if he were poor and obscure. The more he thought of this, the more lonely and sad he felt. When the company dispersed and adjourned to the ballroom, he paced the hall and passages alone, ruminating in a very melancholy condition upon the disappointment he had experienced it chanced while he was lounging about in this moody state that he stumbled upon a flight of stairs dark steep and narrow which he ascended without any thought about the matter and so came into a little music gallery empty and deserted from this elevated post which commanded the whole hall he amused himself in looking down upon the attendants who were clearing away the fragments of the feast very lazily and drinking out of all the bottles and glasses with most commendable perseverance his attention gradually relaxed and he fell fast asleep when he awoke he thought that there must be something the matter with his eyes but rubbing them a little he soon found that the moonlight was really streaming through the east window that the lamps were all extinguished and that he was alone he listened but no distant murmur in the echoing passages not even the shutting of a door broke the deep silence 
He groped his way down the stairs, and found that the door at the bottom was locked on the other side. He began now to comprehend that he must have slept a long time, that he had been overlooked, and was shut up there for the night. His first sensation, perhaps, was not altogether a comfortable one, for it was a dark, chilly, earthy-smelling place, and something too large for a man so situated to feel at home in. However, when the momentary consternation of his surprise was over, he made light of the accident, and resolved to feel his way up the stairs again, and make himself as comfortable as he could in the gallery until morning. As he turned to execute this purpose, he heard the clocks strike three. Any such invasion of a dead stillness as the striking of distant clocks causes it to appear the more intense and insupportable when the sound had ceased. He listened with strained attention in the hope that some clock, lagging behind its fellows, had yet to strike, looking all the time into the profound darkness before him, until it seemed to weave itself into a black tissue, patterned with a hundred reflections of his own eyes. But the bells had all pealed out their warning for that once, and the gust of wind that moaned through the place seemed cold and heavy with their iron breath. The time and circumstances were favourable to reflection. He tried to keep his thoughts to the current, unpleasant though it was, in which they had moved all day, and to think with what a romantic feeling he had looked forward to shaking his old friend by the hand before he died, and what a wide and cruel difference there was between the meeting they had had, and that which he had so often and so long anticipated. Still he was disordered by waking to such sudden loneliness, and could not prevent his mind from running upon odd tales of people of undoubted courage, who, being shut up by night in vaults or churches or other dismal places, had scaled great heights to get out, and fled from silence as they had never done from danger. This brought to his mind the moonlight through the window, and bethinking himself of it, he groped his way back up the crooked stairs but very stealthily, as though he were fearful of being overheard. He was very much astonished when he approached the gallery again, to see a light in the building, still more so on advancing hastily and looking round, to observe no visible source from which it could proceed. But how much greater yet was his astonishment at the spectacle which this light revealed! The statues of the two giants, Gog and Magog, each above fourteen feet in height, those which succeeded to still older and more barbarous figures after the great fire of London, and which stand in the Guildhall to this day, were endowed with life and motion. These guardian genii of the city had quitted their pedestals, and reclined in easy attitudes in the great stained-glass window. Between them was an ancient cask, which seemed to be full of wine, for the younger giant, clapping his huge hands upon it, and throwing up his mighty leg, burst into an exulting laugh, which reverberated through the hall like thunder. Joe Toddyhall instinctively stooped down, and more dead than alive felt his hair stand on end, his knees knock together, and a cold damp break out upon his forehead. But even at that minute curiosity prevailed over every other feeling, and somewhat reassured by the good humour of the giants and their apparent unconsciousness of his presence, he crouched in a corner of the gallery, in as small a space as he could, and peeping between the rails, observed them closely. It was then that the elder giant, who had a flowing grey beard, raised his thoughtful eyes to his companion's face, and in a grave and solemn voice addressed him thus. End of section 1《Master Humphrey's Clock》Section 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. — Master Humphrey's Clock by Charles Dickens Section 2 Chapter 1 Part 2 First Night of the Giant Chronicles Turning towards his companion, the elder giant uttered these words in a grave, majestic tone. Magog, does boisterous mirth beseem the giant warder of this ancient city, 
is this becoming demeanour for a watchful spirit over whose bodiless head so many years have rolled so many changes swept like empty air in whose impalpable nostrils the scent of blood and crime pestilence cruelty and horror has been familiar as breath to mortals in whose sight time has gathered in the harvest of centuries and garnered so many crops of human pride affections hopes and sorrows bethink you of our compact the night wanes feasting revelry and music have encroached upon our usual hours of solitude and morning will be here apace ere we are stricken mute again bethink you of our compact pronouncing these latter words with more of impatience than quite accorded with his apparent age and gravity the giant raised a long pole which he still bears in his hand and tapped his brother giant rather smartly on the head indeed the blow was so smartly administered that the latter quickly withdrew his lips from the cask to which they had been applied and catching up his shield and halberd assumed an attitude of defence his irritation was but momentary for he laid these weapons aside as hastily as he had assumed them and said as he did so you know gog old friend that when we animate these shapes which the londoners of old assigned and not unworthily to the garden genie of their city we are susceptible of some of the sensations which belong to humankind thus when i taste wine i feel blows when i relish the one i disrelish the other therefore gog the more especially as your arm is none of the lightest keep your good staff by your side else we may chance to differ peace be between us amen said the other leaning his staff in the window corner why did you laugh just now to think replied the giant magog laying his hand upon the cask of him who owned this wine and kept it in a cellar hoarded from the light of day for thirty years till it should be fit to drink quoth he he was two score and ten years old when he buried it beneath his house and yet never thought that he might be scarcely fit to drink when the wine became so i wonder it never occurred to him to make himself unfit to be eaten there is very little of him left by this time the night is waning said gog mournfully i know it replied his companion and i see you are impatient but look through the eastern window placed opposite to us that the first beams of the rising sun may every morning gild our giant faces the moon rays fall upon the pavement in a stream of light that to my fancy sinks through the cold stone and gushes into the old crypt below the night is scarcely past its noon, and our great charge is sleeping heavily. They ceased to speak, and looked upward at the moon. The sight of their large black rolling eyes filled Joe Toddyhigh with such horror that he could scarcely draw his breath. Still they took no note of him, and appeared to believe themselves quite alone. "'Our compact,' said Magog, after a pause, "'is, if I understand it, that instead of watching here in silence through the dreary nights we entertain each other with stories of our past experience with tales of the past the present and the future with legends of london and her sturdy citizens from the old simple times that every night at midnight when st paul's bell tolls out one and we may move and speak we thus discourse nor leave such themes till the first grey gleam of day shall strike us dumb is that our bargain brother yes said the giant gog that is the league between us who guard this city by day in spirit and by night in body also and never on ancient holidays have its conduits run wine more merrily than we will pour forth our legendary lore we are old chroniclers from this time hence the crumbled walls encircle us once more the postern gates are closed the drawbridge is up and pent in its narrow din beneath the water foams and struggles with the sunken starlings jerkins and quarter staves are in the streets again the nightly watch is set the rebel sad and lonely in his tower dungeon tries to sleep and weeps for home and children aloft upon the gates and walls are noble heads glaring fiercely down upon the dreaming city and vexing the hungry dogs that scent them in the air and tear the ground beneath with dismal howlings 
the axe the block the rack in their dark chambers give signs of recent use the thames floating past long lines of cheerful windows whence comes a burst of music and a stream of light bears suddenly to the palace wall the last red stain brought on the tide from traitor's gate but your pardon brother the night wears and i am talking idly the other giant appeared to be entirely of this opinion for during the foregoing rhapsody of his fellow sentinel he had been scratching his head with an air of comical uneasiness or rather with an air that would have been very comical if he had been a dwarf or an ordinary-sized man. He winked, too, though it could not be doubted for a moment that he winked to himself. Still he certainly cocked his enormous eye towards the gallery, where the listener was concealed. Nor was this all, for he gaped, and when he gaped, Joe was horribly reminded of the popular prejudice on the subject of giants, and of their fabled power of smelling out Englishmen, however closely concealed his alarm was such that he nearly swooned and it was some little time before his power of sight or hearing was restored when he recovered he found that the elder giant was pressing the younger to commence the chronicles and that the latter was endeavouring to excuse himself on the ground that the night was far spent and it would be better to wait until the next well assured by this that he was certainly about to begin directly the listener collected his faculties by a great effort and distinctly heard Magog express himself to the following effect. In the sixteenth century, and in the reign of Queen Elizabeth of glorious memory, albeit her golden days are sadly rusted with blood, there lived in the city of London a bold young apprentice who loved his master's daughter. There were no doubt within the walls a great many apprentices in this condition but i speak of only one and his name was hugh graham this hugh was apprenticed to an honest bowyer who dwelt in the ward of chapey and was rumoured to possess great wealth rumour was quite as infallible in those days as at the present time but it happened then as now to be sometimes right by accident it stumbled upon the truth when it gave the old bowyer a mint of money his trade had been a profitable one in the time of King Henry the Eighth, who encouraged English archery to the utmost, and he had been prudent and discreet. Thus it came to pass that Mistress Alice, his only daughter, was the richest heiress in all his wealthy ward. Young Hugh had often maintained with staff and cudgel that she was the handsomest. To do him justice, I believe she was if he could have gained the heart of pretty mistress alice by knocking this conviction into stubborn people's heads hugh would have had no cause to fear but though the bowyer's daughter smiled in secret to hear of his doughty deeds for her sake and though her little waiting-woman reported all her smiles and many more to hugh and though he was at a vast expense in kisses and small coin to recompense her fidelity he made no progress in his love he durst not whisper it to Mistress Alice save on sure encouragement, and that she never gave him. A glance of her dark eye as she sat at the door on a summer's evening after prayer-time, while he and the neighbouring prentices exercised themselves in the street with blunted sword and buckler, would fire Hugh's blood so that none could stand before him. But then she glanced at others quite as kindly as on him and where was the use of cracking crowns if mistress alice smiled upon the cracked as well as on the cracker still hugh went on and loved her more and more he thought of her all day and dreamed of her all night long he treasured up her every word and gesture and had a palpitation of the heart whenever he heard her footstep on the stairs or her voice in an adjoining room to him the old bowyer's house was haunted by an angel there was enchantment in the air and space in which she moved it would have been no miracle to hugh if flowers had sprung from the rush-strewn floors beneath the tread of lovely mistress alice never did prentice long to distinguish himself in the eyes of his lady-love so ardently as hugh sometimes he pictured to himself the house taking fire by night and he when all drew back in fear rushing through flame and smoke and bearing her from the ruins in his arms at other times he thought of a rising of fierce rebels an attack upon the city a strong assault upon the bowyer's house in particular and he falling on the threshold pierced with numberless wounds in defence of mistress alice 
if he could only enact some prodigy of valour do some wonderful deed and let her know that she had inspired it he thought he could die contented sometimes the bowyer and his daughter would go out to supper with a worthy citizen at the fashionable hour of six o'clock and on such occasions hugh wearing his blue prentice coat as gallantly as prentice might would attend with a lantern and his trusty club to escort them home these were the brightest moments of his life to hold the light while mistress alice picked her steps to touch her hand as he helped her over broken ways to have her leaning on his arm it sometimes even came to that this was happiness indeed when the nights were fair hugh followed in the rear his eyes riveted on the graceful figure of the bowyer's daughter as she and the old man moved on before him so they threaded the narrow winding streets of the city, now passing beneath the overhanging gables of old wooden houses, whence creaking signs projected into the street, and now emerging from some dark and frowning gateway into the clear moonlight. At such times, or when the shouts of straggling brawlers met her ear, the bowyer's daughter would look timidly back at Hugh, beseeching him to draw nearer and then how he grasped his club and longed to do battle with a dozen rufflers for the love of mistress alice the old bowyer was in the habit of lending money on interest to the gallants of the court and thus it happened that many a richly dressed gentleman dismounted at his door more waving plumes and gallant steeds indeed were seen at the bowyer's house and more embroidered silks and velvets sparkled in his dark shop and darker private closet than at any merchants in the city in those times no less than in the present it would seem that the richest looking cavaliers often wanted money the most of these glittering clients there was one who always came alone he was nobly mounted and having no attendant gave his horse in charge to hugh while he and the bowyer were closeted within once as he sprung into the saddle mistress alice was seated at an upper window and before she could withdraw he had doffed his jewelled cap and kissed his hand hugh watched him caracoling down the street and burnt with indignation but how much deeper was the glow that reddened in his cheeks when raising his eyes to the casement he saw that alice watched the stranger too he came again and often each time arrayed more gaily than before and still the little casement showed him mistress alice at length one heavy day she fled from home it had cost her a hard struggle for all her old father's gifts were strewn about her chambers as if she had parted from them one by one and knew that the time must come when these tokens of his love would wring her heart yet she was gone she left a letter commanding her poor father to the care of hugh and wishing he might be happier than ever he could have been with her for he deserved the love of a better and purer heart than she had to bestow the old man's forgiveness she said she had no power to ask but she prayed god to bless him and so ended with a blot upon the paper where her tears had fallen at first the old man's wrath was kindled and he carried his wrong to the queen's throne itself but there was no redress he learnt at court for his daughter had been conveyed abroad this afterwards appeared to be the truth as there came from france after an interval of several years a letter in her hand it was written in trembling characters and almost illegible little could be made out save that she often thought of home and her old dear pleasant room and that she had dreamt her father was dead and had not blessed her and that her heart was breaking the poor old bowyer lingered on never suffering hugh to quit his sight for he knew now that he had loved his daughter and that was the only link that bound him to earth it broke and at length he died bequeathing his old prentice his trade and all his wealth and solemnly charging him with his last breath to revenge his child if ever he who had worked her misery crossed his path in life again from the time of alice's flight the tilting-ground the fields the fencing-school the summer evening sports knew hugh no more his spirit was dead within him he rose to great eminence and repute among the citizens but was seldom seen to smile and never mingled in their revelries or rejoicing 
brave humane and generous he was beloved by all he was pitied too by those who knew his story and these were so many that when he walked along the streets alone at dusk even the rude common people doffed their caps and mingled a rough air of sympathy with their respect one night in may it was her birth-night and twenty years since she had left her home hugh graham sat in the room she had hallowed in his boyish days he was now a grey-haired man though still in the prime of life old thoughts had borne him company for many hours and the chamber had gradually grown quite dark when he was roused by a low knocking at the outer door he hastened down and opening it saw by the light of a lamp which he had seized upon the way a female figure crouching in the portal it hurried swiftly past him and glided up the stairs he looked for pursuers there were none in sight no not one he was inclined to think it a vision of his own brain when suddenly a vague suspicion of the truth flashed upon his mind he barred the door and hastened widely back yes there she was there in the chamber he had quitted there in her old innocent happy home so changed that none but he could trace one gleam of what she had been there upon her knees with her hands clasped in agony and shame before her burning face my god my god she cried now strike me dead though i have brought death and shame and sorrow on this roof oh let me die at home in mercy there was no tear upon her face then but she trembled and glanced round the chamber everything was in its old place her bed looked as if she had risen from it but that morning the sight of these familiar objects marking the dear remembrance in which she had been held and the blight she had brought upon herself was more than the woman's better nature that had carried her there could bear she wept and fell upon the ground a rumour was spread about in a few days time that the bowyer's cruel daughter had come home and that master graham had given her lodging in his house it was rumoured too that he had resigned her fortune in order that she might bestow it in acts of charity and that he had vowed to guard her in her solitude but that they were never to see each other more these rumours greatly incensed all virtuous wives and daughters in the ward especially when they appeared to receive some corroboration from the circumstance of master graham taking up his abode in another tenement hard by the estimation in which he was held however forbade any questioning on the subject and as the bowyer's house was close shut up and nobody came forth when public shows and festivities were in progress or to flaunt in the public walks or to buy new fashions at the mercer's booths all the well-conducted females agreed among themselves that there could be no woman there these reports had scarcely died away when the wonder of every good citizen male and female was utterly absorbed and swallowed up by a royal proclamation in which her majesty strongly censuring the practice of wearing long spanish rapiers of preposterous length as being a bullying and swaggering custom tending to bloodshed and public disorder commanded that on a particular day therein named certain grave citizens should repair to the city gates and there in public break all rapiers worn or carried by persons claiming admission that exceeded though it were only by a quarter of an inch three standard feet in length royal proclamations usually take their course let the public wonder never so much on the appointed day two citizens of high repute took up their stations at each of the gates attended by a party of the city guard the main body to enforce the queen's will and take custody of all such rebels if any as might have the temerity to dispute it and a few to bear the standard measures and instruments for reducing all unlawful sword-blades to the prescribed dimensions in pursuance of these arrangements master graham and another were posted at ludgate on the hill before st paul's a pretty numerous company were gathered at this sport for besides the officers in attendance to enforce the proclamation there was a motley crowd of lookers-on of various degrees who raised from time to time such shouts and cries as the circumstances called forth a spruce young courtier was the first who appeared he unsheathed a weapon of burnished steel that shone and glistened in the sun and handed it with the newest air to the officer who finding it exactly three feet long returned it with a bow 
thereupon the gallant raised his hat and crying god save the queen passed on amidst the plaudits of the mob then came another a better courtier still who wore a blade but two feet long whereat the people laughed much to the disparagement of his honour's dignity then came a third a sturdy old officer of the army girded with a rapier at least a foot and a half beyond her majesty's pleasure at him they raised a great shout and most of the spectators but especially those who were armourers or cutlers laughed very heartily at the breakage which would ensue but they were disappointed for the old campaigner coolly unbuckling his sword and bidding his servants carry it home again passed through unarmed to the great indignation of all the beholders they relieved themselves in some degree by hooting a tall blustering fellow with a prodigious weapon who stopped short on coming in sight of the preparations and after a little consideration turned back again but all this time no rapier had been broken although it was high noon and all cavaliers of any quality or appearance were taking their way toward st paul's churchyard during these proceedings master graham had stood apart strictly confining himself to the duty imposed upon him and taking little heed of anything beyond he stepped forward now as a richly dressed gentleman on foot followed by a single attendant was seen advancing up the hill as this person drew nearer the crowd stopped their clamour and bent forward with eager looks master graham standing alone in the gateway and the stranger coming slowly towards him they seemed as it were set face to face the nobleman for he looked one had a haughty and disdainful air which bespoke the slight estimation of which he held the citizen the citizen on the other hand preserved the resolute bearing of one who was not to be frowned down or daunted and who cared very little for any nobility but that of worth and manhood it was perhaps some consciousness on the part of each of these feeding in the other that infused a more stern expression into their regards as they came closer together your rapier worthy sir at the instant that he pronounced these words graham started and falling back some paces laid his hand upon the dagger in his belt you are the man whose horse i used to hold before the bowyer's door you are that man speak out you prentice hound said the other you are he i know you well now cried graham let no man step between us two or i shall be his murderer with that he drew his dagger and rushed in upon him the stranger had drawn his weapon from the scabbard ready for the scrutiny before a word was spoken he made a thrust at his assailant but the dagger which graham clutched in his left hand being the dirk in use at that time for parrying such blows promptly turned the point aside they closed the dagger fell rattling on the ground and graham resting his adversary's sword from his grasp plunged it through his heart as he drew it out it snapped in two leaving a fragment in the dead man's body all this passed so swiftly that the bystanders looked on without an effort to interfere but the man was no sooner down than an uproar broke forth which rent the air the attendant rushing through the gate proclaimed that his master a nobleman had been set upon and slain by a citizen the word quickly spread from mouth to mouth st paul's cathedral and every bookshop ordinary and smoking-house in the churchyard poured out its stream of cavaliers and their followers who mingling together in a dense tumultuous body struggled sword in hand towards the spot with equal impetuosity and stimulating each other by loud cries and shouts the citizens and common people took up the quarrel on their side and encircling master graham a hundred deep forced him from the gate in vain he waved the broken sword above his head crying that he would die on london's threshold for their sacred homes they bore him on and ever keeping him in the midst so that no man could attack him fought their way into the city the clash of swords and roar of voices the dust and heat and pressure the trampling under foot of men the distracted looks and shrieks of women at the windows above as they recognized their relatives or lovers in the crowd the rapid tolling of alarm-bells the furious rage and passion of the scene were fearful 
those who being on the outskirts of each crowd could use their weapons with effect fought desperately while those behind maddened with baffled rage struck at each other over the heads of those before them and crushed their own fellows wherever the broken sword was seen above the people's heads towards that spot the cavaliers made a new rush every one of these charges was marked by sudden gaps in the throng where men were trodden down but as fast as they were made the tide swept over them and still the multitude pressed on again a confused mass of swords clubs staves broken plumes fragments of rich cloaks and doublets and angry bleeding faces all mixed up together in inextricable disorder the design of the people was to force master graham to take refuge in his dwelling and to defend it until the authorities could interfere or they could gain time for parley but either from ignorance or in the confusion of the moment they stopped at his old house which was closely shut some time was lost in beating the doors open and passing him to the front about a score of the boldest of the other party threw themselves into the torrent while this was being done and reaching the door at the same moment with himself cut him off from his defenders i never will turn in such a righteous cause so help me heaven cried graham in a voice that at last made itself heard and confronting them as he spoke least of all will i turn upon this threshold which owes its desolation to such men as ye i give no quarter and i will have none strike for a moment they stood at bay at that moment a shot from an unseen hand apparently fired by some person who had gained access to one of the opposite houses struck graham in the brain and he fell dead a low wail was heard in the air many people in the concourse cried that they had seen a spirit glide across the little casement window of the bowyer's house a dead silence succeeded after a short time some of the flushed and heated throng laid down their arms and softly carried the body within doors others fell off or slunk away in knots of two or three others whispered together in groups and before a numerous guard which then rode up could muster in the street it was nearly empty those who carried master graham to the bed upstairs were shocked to see a woman lying beneath the window with her hands clasped together after trying to recover her in vain they laid her near the citizen who still retained tightly grasped in his right hand the first and last sword that was broken that day at ludgate the giant uttered these concluding words with sudden precipitation and on the instant the strange light which had filled in the hall faded away joe toddyhigh glanced involuntarily at the eastern window and saw the first pale gleam of morning he turned his head again towards the other window in which the giants had been seated it was empty the cask of wine was gone and he could dimly make out that the two great figures stood mute and motionless upon their pedestals after rubbing his eyes and wondering for a full half an hour during which time he observed morning come creeping on apace he yielded to the drowsiness which overpowered him and fell into a refreshing slumber when he awoke it was broad day the building was open and workmen were busily engaged in removing the vestiges of last night's feast stealing gently down the little stairs and assuming the air of some early lounger who had dropped in from the street he walked up to the foot of each pedestal in turn and attentively examined the figure it supported there could be no doubt about the features of either he recollected the exact expression they had worn at different passages of their conversation and recognized in every line and lineament the giants of the night assured that it was no vision but that he had heard and seen with his own proper senses he walked forth determining to all hazards to conceal himself in the guild hall again that evening he further resolved to sleep all day so that he might be very wakeful and vigilant and above all that he might take notice of the figures at the precise moment of their becoming animated and subsiding into their old state which he greatly reproached himself for not having done already correspondence to master humphrey sir before you proceed any further in your account of your friends and what you say and do when you meet together 
"'Excuse me if I proffer my claim to be elected to one of the vacant chairs in that old room of yours. Don't reject me without further consideration, for if you do you will be sorry for it afterwards. You will, upon my life. I enclose my card, sir, in this letter. I never was ashamed of my name, and I never shall be. I am considered a devilish gentlemanly fellow, and I act up to the character.' If you want a reference, ask any of the men at our club. Ask any fellow who goes there to write his letters what sort of conversation mine is. Ask him if he thinks I have the sort of voice that will suit your deaf friend and make him hear, if he can hear anything at all. Ask the servants what they think of me. There's not a rascal among em, sir, but will tremble to hear my name.' that reminds me don't you say too much about that housekeeper of yours it's a low subject damned low i tell you what sir if you vote me into one of those empty chairs you'll have among you a man with a fund of gentlemanly information that'll rather astonish you i can let you into a few anecdotes about some fine women of title that are quite high life sir the tip-top sort of thing I know the name of every man who has been out on an affair of honour within the last five and twenty years. I know the private particulars of every cross and squabble that has taken place upon the turf, at the gaming-table, or elsewhere, during the whole of that time. I have been called the gentlemanly chronicle. You may consider yourself a lucky dog upon my soul. You may congratulate yourself, though I say so it's an uncommon good notion that of yours not letting anybody know where you live i have tried it but there has always been an anxiety respecting me which has found me out your deaf friend is a cunning fellow to keep his name so close i have tried that too but have always failed i shall be proud to make his acquaintance tell him so with my compliments you must have been a queer fellow when you were a child confounded queer it's odd all about the picture in your first paper prosy but told in a devilish gentlemanly sort of way in places like that i could come in with great effect with a touch of life don't you feel that i am anxiously awaiting for your next paper to know whether your friends live upon the premises and at your expense which i take it for granted is the case if i am right in this impression i know a charming fellow an excellent companion and most delightful company who will be proud to join you some years ago he seconded a great many prize-fighters and once fought an amateur match himself since then he has driven several males broken at different periods all the lamps on the right-hand side of oxford street and six times carried away every bell-handle in bloomsbury square besides turning off the gas in various thoroughfares in point of gentlemanliness he is unrivalled and i should say that next to myself he is of all men the best suited to your purpose expecting your reply i am etc etc master humphrey informs this gentleman that his application both as it concerns himself and his friend is rejected end of chapter one End of section 2